everyone. Welcome back to the Hidden History of Business podcast. I'm Meredith Hutchison Hartley. I'm Frank Hutchison. And I'm Emily Geddes. And today we're going to talk some more about this idea that what, what do we mean when we say it's hidden history? Why would the history be hidden? And we're not just talking about records that are buried somewhere. We're talking about the really what it is about how we think and our assumptions and our thought processes that hide the history from us because it's really hidden in plain sight. We're going to go over a few different examples of how that happens and what the overarching themes are that create our blind spots as students of history. Now, Emily, you were just talking about a really great example of a really popular phrase we hear all the time now. Well, there is a fantastic uh, historian of early America and women's history. Uh, her name is Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. Uh, she, in one of her papers, in one of her early papers, she was writing about uh, Puritan funeral services, and she made kind of an offhand statement that well-behaved women seldom make history. And she was commenting on the fact that there's so little known about so many women in history that, that followed the social mores of the time, that were good and productive within their spheres, but didn't leave any wider mark on society as a whole. But this little phrase, well-behaved women seldom make history, has kind of become almost a rallying cry for women who see it as, as a almost a defiant uh, statement of we want to make history and so we're going to not be well behaved um, and it, it, it's morphed a little bit sometimes you'll see well-behaved women rarely make history mm -hmm. I've seen it a couple times well-behaved women never make history but uh, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich's point was that the history is there and she has done so much work on this mm -hmm. herself just some amazing amazing work the history is there, even for the well-behaved women, mm -hmm. uh, we just have to look a little bit harder for it, and that's what she's done with her career. Well, I think it's really interesting because we hear a lot, and uh, I've ranted about this many times, that in business history we focus on the, the anomalies, we focus on the Steve Jobs and uh, the, the people who were really aberrations and honestly shouldn't have succeeded because in many cases these, these great business gurus were absolute jackasses. They were not nice. They they ruined people who they worked with. They intimidated them. They really did everything wrong. They happened to have great ideas, and people supported them, so that's why they succeeded. But for every Steve Jobs, there are thousands of amazing business leaders and managers who are doing amazing work every day, but they don't get the notice. Even though many of them are innovating, they're doing great work. And this idea that we, you don't have to be exceptional to do good work and build amazing companies and make a difference. And it's really interesting that that even plays out with how we interpret that quote, that we have to be aberrant. We have to do all these, these wild, crazy things in order to make history and make a difference. But what we find more and more as we, we study is that it's the quieter cases. And I'm not against, and believe me, I'm very much a nonconformist, but it's not about the splash you make or how deviant or how much you, you differ from society's norms. It's about doing good work. And a lot of the best work in history was done by people we never hear about because either we overlooked it or they didn't share it in a way that people noticed. Well, and another example of that from Laurel Thatcher Ulrich's work is her book, A Midwife's Tale. It's a, it actually won the Pulitzer Prize, mm -hmm. and it is based off of the diaries of a woman named Martha Ballard, who she was born in 1734-35, and died in 1812, but she was this midwife and healer in Augusta, Maine, Hallowell, Augusta. Or she wrote in her diary every day for 27 years. Wow. 9,965 entries, which was really rather remarkable for the time. It was remarkable mm -hmm. to have a woman that was educated to the point where she would be keeping a diary, and certainly for that expansive a period of time. So we have presidents and any major American founders we don't have that much documentation from. Yeah, definitely. And it's really interesting because Martha Ballard's diary was known about by several historians, they even quoted select passages in uh, some histories of the area in Maine, but for the most part, it was it was kind of shunted to the side. It was considered, you know, repetitive and boring, uh, just trivia, trivial mm -hmm. for the most part. Until Laurel Thatcher Ulrich got a hold of it, and she found this wealth of information 
in these what other people have considered trivial details. Like that, what? Well, what was she writing about? Um, she started every journal entry with the date and the weather, for one oh. thing, which I found really, really interesting. But she talked about everything from how much she got paid for a certain delivery to you know, details of the delivery themselves. They, she often just said delivered or safe delivered. But she also talked about local scandals. She talked about her concerns for her children. Um, she talked about the process of for her children finding spouses and setting up households together. There was a, quite the the scandal in the area when a judge was uh, prosecuted for rape, and she had some evidence to present in that case. Mm -hmm. There was another uh, incident where a family up the road, the entire family was murdered by the father, and she wrote about that in her journal. Was she a good midwife? She was an incredible midwife. She recorded, let me look, um, 814 deliveries over the 27 years. 768 of them were uncomplicated deliveries that she just said were delivered or safe delivered. Uh, there were only complications in 5.6% of the births that she recorded. Wow. Not a single mother in the 814 deliveries died during delivery. And only five died during the what they called the lying-in period, the few days right after birth which is, again, incredible for the time. 14 of the 814 were stillbirths, and five of the newborns died within a couple of hours, which is high compared to maybe today's first world standards mm -hmm. in most areas, but for the time, it was an incredibly low mortality rate, especially when you compared it to doctors, the actual physicians, or, heaven forbid, the hospitals in large cities. She quoted in the book that in some 18th century London and Dublin hospitals, maternal mortality ranged from 30 to 200 per thousand births. Oh my gosh. Compared with five for Martha. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So it went from a 0.5, which is mm -hmm. percent mm -hmm. for her, to anywhere from 3 to 20%. Yeah. Uh, it, the most modern hospitals of the day. Right, which is amazing because what I'm hearing is someone who beat her competitors in every important standard. She was probably cheaper than they were. She had a better success rate. I mean, not a single mother dying during childbirth is... It very much challenges what our perceptions were at the time. And we have this woman who actually documented her life and how she was. Well, there, were, there were, if I recall correctly, it's been a little while since uh -huh. I read the book, but there were other women in town that functioned as midwives, mm -hmm. um, but not tons. It wasn't an incredibly populated area. And to, in the later years, there were some doctors in town. And it was interesting, if I recall correctly, the way that she would refer to certain doctors. <laughs> if she approved of the way they handled things, and if she didn't approve, she didn't come out and, and say anything too scandalous, but she made it very clear in her diary that she did not consider this particular doctor to be very competent. Which um, is a good lesson on handling your competition. Yes, mm -hmm. there's that too. But you also have to realize that in that day and time, doctors were like at the top of the social mm -hmm. order because they were educated. Hey, they were the people that basically be there when you die. Well, but the question is if they were so educated, why was she beating them in stats? And I mean, there's a lot more to dig into, obviously, but... What's really fascinating is that this woman who was doing such amazing work was overlooked because we define, I mean, she was running an extremely successful business by all standards mm -hmm. and supporting her family and dominating the local market. But why isn't she included in histories of business for the time? Why do we overlook that? Well, well a lot of because she's, I mean, the laws of the time, she couldn't own any property. Women historically were, I mean, even if they weren't property owners, they were running their local industries and economies. They survived oh, on, on women's work. And I think that's one of our biases, is that when we go to research the history of colonial America, we're looking at the tradesmen. We're looking at who owned the ships, who owned the stores. The plantation owners. Exactly. Right. Benjamin Franklin inventing things, and Thomas Jefferson running his plantation, and George Washington deciding to sell whiskey. Right. I mean, but then you get back to Martha Ballard, and her contribution to her family was you know, economic, like financial mm -hmm. in some cases, when she was paid for helping with these deliveries. But her economic contribution to her family went far beyond that in mm -hmm. the, the work she did with the family farm and preserving the food and mm -hmm. doing the laundry. And she helped out as a 
healer other than as a midwife when there was a scarlet fever outbreak and diphtheria. Mm-hmm. She lost three of her kids to of the nine that she had herself. She lost three of them to diphtheria. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I find that interesting because um, I, I have a, I don't want to say a crush, but I, I really love studying the history of John and Abigail Adams. And it's interesting as I read a lot of histories, they define John as this farmer and as the statesman. But he was gone. I mean, for the majority of 13 years, he was absent from their family farm. He and his wife barely saw each other for huge stretches of time. She was running the farm. She was managing the economy and the workers and balancing all of that. But we don't ever define her as she was the farmer. She was the business manager. She was the wife of the owner, which is an example of how historical biases and laws have affected how we view these people who were solving problems. Because I guarantee you, if we actually look at what they were doing, Abigail was solving a whole lot more problems on an everyday basis. On the farm. On the farm than John was on the farm, even though she wasn't the legal business owner. And I think we can extend this even further back into history. Well, you see it over and over again, this idea of the stratification, if you will. And the legality. Men, Men are obviously important. In fact, quite often, the only record we have of wives is... They're, they're, exactly. If we're lucky, their first name, mm-hmm. and quite often we don't even have that. It's Mrs. John Adams, mm-hmm. not yeah. Abigail Adams. She's remarkable because she was the first lady and everything else. But history defines of women, her. Yeah, history defines her as the wife. Mm-hmm. And other peop- other women got defined that way. But that happened in other parts of society. I was thinking of during the Napoleonic Wars, talking mm-hmm. about medicine, the doctors were considered superior to the surgeons. The surgeons were basically glorified barbers. Right. <laughs> but when it came time to treating wounds, when they started taking a look at the statistics, the surgeons, for some reason, had a higher success rate. And what it came down to was that the surgeons washed their hands mm-hmm. between patients. The doctors didn't. And, of course, passed the disease on. Well, I think what we're really getting on here is this idea that one of our biases comes from our perceptions of social status. Yes. And that we're Definitely. not always aware of how that's being influenced. That we expect the person who had the degrees and the legal recognition or the titles was somehow more qualified, which is such a funny word. What actually makes you more qualified? Mm-hmm. Or that the doctors at the time were somehow more qualified than Martha Ballard. The gentleman is better than the tradesman. The tradesman is better than the the farmer. The farmer is better than the servant. Which is funny, especially studying Asian history, you find a lot of examples. Emily, you talk about this with Incan history, that these other societies had technology and amazingly complex civilizations long before Europe or the modern U.S. discovered them, discovered in quotation marks. And as I went back researching this, I found that we assume that, well, they must, they may have had these things, but they couldn't have been very successful because, aha, the Europeans came and took it and did it even better. But that's not the case. One of the things I found while researching is that the amount of incentive and ownership actually affected whether or not an idea spread. In Europe, there were, to some degree, legal protections, so that if you had an idea or a business, you could, to some degree, defend that within a guild or within common law. If you go to China, if someone had an amazing idea, I mean, there was bamboo plumbing, they were mining infinitely, I mean, years, centuries before uh, Westerners were. But if you had an awesome idea and you told a lot of people about it, the emperor would come and he would take it and he would use it and it would go out to everyone else and you would lose your competitive edge. There was no real incentive to talk to everyone about your awesome ideas. The same is true in Russia or anywhere where there was this really strong imperial system. And we see that over and over again. So we make this assumption that because we don't hear about it, because it wasn't institutionalized, they didn't have these solutions. But they did. So there's another bias we have, the assumption that if you're successful, you everyone will know about it. And that's just not always the case. Thank you. We'll see you at the next episode. To learn more about the subject that we discussed today, you can find multimedia content, links to articles we discussed, and videos on our website at www.hiddenhistoryofbusiness.com. You can also find us on Facebook as The Hidden History of Business and on Twitter as well. Thanks for listening.